the Ice Age. We're going to talk about ice all over the uh, Earth during the Pleistocene. I'm ignoring previous ice ages, real or imagined. Um, to start out with, I'll point out that uh, Charles Lyell, in his book Principles of Geology, set out, uh, as he wrote to a friend, to free the science from Moses. That implies that Lyell didn't think Moses had it right. Uh, his most powerful argument against uh, Moses, specifically against the creation in a flood, was that only processes seen today at the rates that we see today can be used in explaining the past. That, of course, strikes stri st directly at the heart of miracle. Uh, as it is sometimes phrased, the present is the key to the past. Uh, a little later, Agassi pro proposed an ice age based on his own work and that of contemporaries, although he didn't always acknowledge that. And that actually was a problem for, for strict uniformitarianism because that implied that at one time the Earth had a lot more ice than it does now. And it's not just simply the rates that we see today and the processes that we see today. Well, we do see the processes on a minor scale, but certainly not in the kind of scale that uh, Agassi persuaded the scientific community. And I would say at least partly the creationist scientific community as well. Um, but it was uh, a challenge to the diluvialism of the time, which said that Noah's flood was the latest of a series of flood, because the diluvial deposits now turned out to be the Ice Age deposits, specifically things like uh, moraines. Um, and uh, so the... Uh, Trying to fit Noah's flood into a long series of catastrophes turned out to be a failure. And uh, creationists now will argue that uh, we have to include pretty much the whole record. Um, I think there's some that will argue for a little less than that, but still major portions of the fossil record are now attributed to the flood because if you don't do that, you can't explain um, things. Uh, using a flood. The little, uh, uh, the little flood is gone. Now, as time went on with uh, standard geology, by the 1960s there were four stages of glaciation that were identified. The Wisconsin, Illinois, and Kansas, and Nebraska. There are four different ice sheets. At least that was the story. So we've gone now from one ice age to four. Um, and, and this is pretty much the story about 40 years ago, right? Um, and uh, they spanned about one million years. Um, and in the Midwest U.S., the Wisconsinian was the most recent one, and then there's the Illinois and Kansas and the Nebraskan. But in fact, as you can see, in North Europe, they had four similar stages. And in the Alps, they had four stages. And in the British Isles, they had four stages. And they assumed that they were pretty much contemporary. Now, it's interesting how all of the geologists from around Europe and North America came to the same conclusions. And that nobody agrees with them now. Um, the uh, uh, textbook that I learned uh, geology from in, in graduate school was uh, View of the Earth and it has a nice uh, uh, illustration. Now, uh, before you read it too carefully, I want you to notice that there's less ice on the right and more ice on the left, which is not the way you would usually think of it. Um, but here's where we're supposed to be at present, and the Wisconsinian comes up, and then it goes back to a stage that's even more melted than what we have right now. And then the Illinoisan, and then the Kansan, and then the Nebraskan, and that whole thing is uh, 
one million years, which means there are four stages over um, so of about 250 million years, uh, pardon me, 250,000 years apiece. Well, <coughs> then the work of Milutin Milankovic uh, proposed three different types of cycles that we're going to get into here. A 23,000 year cycle of precession of the Earth's axis. That is, the Earth behaves a little bit like a top and slowly precesses. Um, uh, and it takes about 23,000 years for the North Pole to point to Polaris again after it's been all the way around. Uh, at one point, Vega will be the, uh, will be the North Star. There is a 41,000 year cycle of obliquity of the Earth's axis. That is to say, even if you consider the precession, there's a slight amount of change in the angle from about 22.5 to 24.5 degrees. We're right now about 23 or so. Um, Inclined to the earth. so the, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn will move up and down with that cycle, and then there's a 100,000 year cycle of variations in the ex eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. What that means is that instead of the Earth's orbit being perfectly round, it's slightly an ellipse. So the Sun moves from the center to a little bit over to one side. And um, uh, that is supposed to take place because of uh, gravitational pull of various other planets um, that we get in, in harmony or out of harmony with. Um, and here the, uh, here's a plot of the two different kinds of cycles. Here's the, uh, the um, cycle going around the uh, precession and the influence that it should have on climate. And then here's the obliquity, which you can see also follows a more or less of a sine wave. Um, and here is the eccentricity, which is kind of unusual uh, in that it, uh, it doesn't have a nice sinusoidal pattern like these other ones do, uh, looking more like a, a a set of humps rather than a uh, rather than a sine wave, and not being precisely well, what it's supposed to be. These are calculations that were made by Milankovic and uh, seconded by multiple others. Um, and if you're wondering uh, how to get more information, the uh, uh, NASA has put out a nice little. Um, uh, website uh, that uh, gives uh, some of the stuff that uh, Milankovitch has done and also a little more on his life. And uh, I'm going to read a few of them because it may make things a little more, uh, put things a little more in perspective. Orbital variations, changes in orbital eccentricity affect the Earth-Sun distance. Currently, a difference of only about 3% or 5 million kilometers exists between the closest approach, the perihelion, uh, which occurs on or about January 3, and the furthest departure, aphelion, which occurs on a, about July 4. Notice that these are not in sync with our winter and summer. They're closer in sync with uh, the southern hemisphere winter and summer. Um, This difference in distance amounts to about a 6% increase in incoming solar radiation or insulation from July to January. Actually, be a little bit more than that. Uh, the shape of the Earth's orbit changes from being elliptical, high eccentricity, 0 0.7. Uh, I took that from elsewhere in the uh, article. Impossible to show at the revolution, uh, resolution of a web page, so I didn't try to illustrate it for you. To being nearly circular with low eccentricity in a cycle that takes between 90,000 and 100,000 years. When the orbit is highly elliptical, 
well, it never is really highly elliptical, but it's more elliptical than usual. Uh, the amount of insulation received at perihelion would be of the order of 20 to 30 percent greater than at aphelion, resulting in a substantially different climate from what we experience today. That is, uh, the closeness to the sun is going to make quite a bit of difference. Um, obliquity, that is change in the axial tilt. As the axial tilt increases, the seasonal contrast increases so that the winters are colder and the summers are warmer in both hemispheres. Today, the Earth's axis is tilted about 23.5 degrees from the plane of its orbit around the sun, but this tilt changes during a cycle that averages about 40,000 years, maybe a little over. The tilt of the axis varies between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees. Because this tilt changes, the seasons as we know them can become exaggerated. More tilt means more severe seasons, warmer summers and colder winters. Less tilt means less severe seasons, cooler summers, and milder winters. Interestingly enough, it's not the cold winters that make the difference. It's the cool summers that are thought to allow snow and ice to, to last from year to year in high latitudes, eventually building up into massive ice sheets. There are positive feedbacks in the climate system as well because an earth covered with more snow reflects more of the sun's energy into space, causing additional cooling. Precession. Changes in axial precession alter the dates of perihelion and aphelion and therefore increase the seasonal contrast in one hemisphere and decrease the seasonal contrast in the other hemisphere. Right now, the south, uh, southern hemisphere is almost perfectly lined up to get more heat in the summer and less in the winter. Um, in uh, about uh, well, 23,000 uh, divided by 2, which is 11,500 years, it's going to be the reverse and will be closer to the sun during the summer in the northern hemisphere. And further away in the winter as well as being tilted toward the sun in the summer. Using these three orbital variations, Milankovitch was able to formulate a comprehensive mathematical model that has calculated latitudinal differences in insulation, insulation is a fancy word for how much sunlight you get, and the corresponding surface temperature for 600,000 years prior to the year uh, 1800. He then attempted to correlate these changes with the growth and retreat of the ice ages. Well, we already saw that the conventional wisdom was that it was one every 250,000 years, so it doesn't really match any of those. Uh, to do this, Milankovitch assumed that radiation changes in some latitudes and seasons are more important to ice sheet growth and decay than those in others. Then, at the suggestion of German climatologist Vladimir uh, Köppen, he chose summer insulation at 65 degrees north as the most important latitude and season to model because presumably the northern hemisphere was more important for uh, ice ages than the southern hemisphere. All the southern hemisphere is, has an, is in Antarctica right? and, uh, and maybe a little bit at the tip of South America and so forth. Um, which wouldn't make that much difference, but the northern hemisphere would make a great deal of difference. And that's where most of the studies have been done. Um, he was reasoning that the great ice sheets grew near this latitude and that cooler summers might reduce summer snow melt, leading to a positive annual snow budget and ice sheet growth. But for about 50 years, Milankovitch's theory was largely ignored. Then, in 1976, a study published in the journal Science examined the deep sea sediment cores and found that Milankovitch's theory did, in fact, correspond to periods of climate change. Well, and we're going to be looking at that study in just a little bit. Specifically, the authors were able to extract the record of temperature change going back 450,000 years and found that major variations in climate were closely associated with changes in the geometry, that is, eccentricity, obliquity, and precession of Earth's orbit. Indeed, ice ages had occurred when the Earth was going through different stages of or orbital variation. 
Since this study, the National Research Council of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has embraced the Milankovitch cycle model. Orbital variations remain the most thoroughly examined mechanism of climate change on timescales of tens of thousands of years and are by far the clearest case of a direct effect of changing insulation on the lower atmosphere of Earth. Mm, reading that... It's the most thoroughly examined, doesn't mean it's the one that fits the data best, but um, um, the clearest case for a direct effect of changing insulation, how much sunlight you get makes a difference on whether you have a, a, uh, an ice age. Um, but clearest doesn't necessarily mean all that clear, as we will find out. The article that was quoted is Hayes, Imbrie, and Shackleton, Variations in the Earth's Orbit, Pacemaker of the Ice Ages, found in the article Science. And uh, through ResearchGate, you can get the article free. Um, the, the article does not have an abstract, so I just start right in. For more than a century, the cause of fluctuations in the Pleistocene ice sheets has remained an intriguing and unsolved scientific mystery. Interest in this problem has generated a number of possible explanations. I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course. Um, among these ideas, only the orbital hypothesis has been formulated so as to produce predict the frequencies of major Pleistocene glacial fluctuations. Thus, it is the only explanation that can be tested geologically by determining what these frequencies are. Our main purpose here is to make such a test. So they're going to test Milankovitch's theory and see whether it fits. Skipping over a few paragraphs. Our geological data comprise measurements of three climatically sensitive parameters in two deep sea sediment cores. These cores were taken from an area where previous work showed that sediment is accumulating fast enough to preserve information at the frequencies of interest. Um, I, I think that's three centimeters per thousand years or something like that. Although how you avoid bioturbation is difficult for me to say, but yeah. Measurements of one variable, the per mil enrichment of oxygen 18, make it possible to correlate these records with others throughout the world and to establish that the sediment studied accumulated without significant hiatuses and at rates, um, which I stole from elsewhere in the article, three, uh, three greater than three centimeters per thousand years, which show no major fluctuations. Moving on. Geological data, so this is what they're measuring in those cores. And there's two of them. They, we have measured uh, delta 18O, the oxygen isotopic composition of planktonic foraminifera, uh, to TS, an estimate of summer seas, uh, sea surface temperature at the core site derived from a statistical analysis of radiolarian assemblages. Basically, certain radiolarians grow better in warmer water and certain ones do better relatively speaking in colder water and so if you measure the warm versus cold ones you can get an estimate as to how warm the water was and three percentage of cycladophora divisiana the relative abundance of irradialarin species not used in the estimation of TS because you can find it uh, at different temperatures. So it's not useful in, t in finding the, the surface temperature. Identical samples were analyzed for the three variables at 10 centimeter intervals through each core. We've got two cores and they're going to see if they correlate with each other and they're also going to see what the percentage of different um, uh, radiolarins is and what the uh, uh, how much oxygen 18 is in them compared to oxygen 16. And finally, uh, uh, 
how much of it is cycladophora. And as we'll see, we have one more data point that they'll eventually do for one of the cores, and that is how much car uh, calcium carbonate is in it. The delta 18O, that's the change in the percentage of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. In our subantarctic core is a northern hemisphere climatic record. That is, it reflects how much I ice has locked up uh, oxygen. Um, and the idea is that at times when there's more ice, there's more uh, oxygen-18 in the rest of the world's oceans. The accuracy of TS as an estimate of sea surface temperature is uh, plus or minus 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that's how accurately you can estimate the sea temperature by just looking at the different kinds of organisms that, li that lived in it and that ha are now dead. Its reproducibility as an index of faunal change is about uh, 0 0.32 degrees centigrade. So it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty accurate. Uh, they talk about the Sea of Otkots, which has fresh water on top and very cold water fairly close to the surface. And they say the high abundance of sea divisiana during glacial times in the Antarctic may be due to a similar surface water structure to the Sea of Otkots, uh, which has a lot of C. divisiana in it. And um, the stratigraphic sequence of how are you going to be sure that you've got the time right? Well, because the delta 18O record in deep sea sediments primarily reflects global ice volume, it is globally synchronous in open ocean cores. And these are two open ocean cores. They're as far away from land as just almost any place else. Um, and provides, along with standard bio stratigraphical techniques, a basic stratigraphy for the last million years. This stratigraphy has a resolution limited only by ocean mixing, about a thousand years for that, and bioturbation. Yeah, bioturbation is a problem, or could be, certainly. Um, and here's some of the uh, data that they have. The uh, delta 18, which is measured directly, is here. The estimated surface temperature, judging from the kinds of radial lens, you'll notice that well, we have a peak here, although it kind of comes down, which is a little disconcerting. Um, generally, they're the same shape. Although what this trough is doing near the peak here, why this peak is high here, not there, you know, you can uh, you can look at it, and you and here's the percentage of uh, C. divisiana, and you can see it follows kind of the same pattern. Although here, this G looks to be in a trough where nothing else is there. So there's some stuff in here that's not really understood. Um, here's a, another plot of, I believe that's the other core, and here you can see there are three plots. Oh boy, this one is high, and then it drops down low, but then it comes back up high right here where they don't match at all. And in the meantime, this one drops down. Yeah. Well, you have one hump that lines up very nicely. You do with that data what you want. And skipping on down the time control, well, in order to make this work, you have to have some kind of time, uh, time frame to put it in. Um, because depth is not necessarily equivalent to time, as they recognize. A basic chronological framework for these sequences is established by determining the absolute ages of certain horizons. In RC 11-120, that's one of the cores, carbon-14 dating at the 36 to 39 centimeter level, they had to take enough of a chunk to actually do the date, yields an age of 9,400 plus or minus 600 years. That is, if you trust carbon-14 dating in that area. This level 
marks the most recent uh, surface temperature maximum and substantially precedes the northern hemisphere hypothermal, which at many uh, sites has been dated at 6,000 years ago. Uh, so the age of the boundary between stage 12 and stage 1, uh, that should be 11. Uh, this thing does interesting things when you copy it, um, including dropping some doubled things was taken from Shackleton and Opdyke, who estimated it at 44,000 years in an equatorial Pacific core. So they have another core that they, um, that they estimate what the date should be, and then they bring that over to here. And in order to figure out whether this is reliable, you're going to have to figure out how they did the other core. By assuming uniform accumulation between the core top and the magnetic reversal marking the Brunhis Machiyama boundary. This is where the, the polarity of the Earth reversed. And of course, that is a at least challengeable assumption. Extinction of S universes occurred globally on this stage boundary, so that the estimates of 40 uh, pardon me, 400,000 years for the age of this extinction in the North Pacific and Antarctic constitute independent determinations for the age of the 12-11 boundary. That's how uh, the range of these figures expresses the current age uncertainty of this boundary. So um, here you have an extinction that went worldwide uh, presumably at the same time, or at least within, I don't know, a thousand or two thousand years of, of itself, for reasons which are not clear. And uh, you can use that as a, as a dating mechanism to correlate these, these cores not only with each other, but with other cores as well. And if you've dated the other cores, then you've got these things dated. In many areas, there's evidence for a change in accumulation around stage six. Ooh, so the, the naive assumption that a certain amount has been laid every so often is probably naive. Um, so that we have used an independent estimate of 251,000 years for the stage eight, seven boundary. This estimate like that for the 1211 boundary was taken from the Pacific core V28, 238. So now they're using uh, the other core to try to define their time frame again. Um, and when they ran this through a computer program to find uh, harmonics, this is what they found. Um, they found harmonics at 23K and at 41K and also at 19K. Now, what's interesting to me is that if you look at that, you don't see a harmonic at 100K, which should be about here or so. Why that is is not clear. Um, although uniform sedimentation is an ideal which is unlikely to prevail precisely anywhere, as they noticed, the fact that the characteristics of the oxygen isotope record are present throughout the core suggests that there can be no substantially, uh, no substantially lacunae. I'm sure that that should be substantial. While the striking resemblance to records from distant areas show that there can be no dis gross distortion, distortion of accumulation rate. So because everything matches, then you can't have a lot of extra accumulation. Well, of course, if you postulate a flood, uh, you might expect a bit more accumulation. And um, so a lot of this depends on there must have been a lot of time in order to make it work because just going straight down through the record, it looks like there has been a change in the rate of accumulation. And the question is, at that point, how much? 
Nevertheless, five of the six spectra cal calculated are characterized by three discrete pe peaks, which occupy the same parts of the frequency range in each spectrum in Table 3. These corresponding, those corresponding to periods from 87,000 to 119,000. Oh, in case you're wondering, it's really 90 to 100,000. It's not 100,000 exact. Um, are labeled A, 37,000 to 47,000 B, and 21,000 to 24,000 C. So there's, it's not precise. This suggests that the B and C peaks represent a response to obliquity and precession variation respectively. And uh, here's, uh, here's some of the reworked data put into a special computer program. And now your 100 million year harmonic stands out. And your 23 and, and your 47, uh, pardon me, 41, uh, are still there, but not nearly as big. Now, where, did, where was it to begin with? Uh, all of these have a significant peak there, including here and here where it's not quite as big as expected. In fact, here it's one of the lesser ones. You have a 41,000 of primary. But the rest of these, you can see that the 100,000 year one dominates the other two. So the 100,000 year cycle, the dominant cycles in all our spectra, figure 5C in table 4, are about 100,000 years long, an observation which merely confirms a geological opinion now, now widespread. So good, we got the same answer that everybody else was expecting. Yet this cycle would not arise as a linear response of the climate system to variations in obliquity and precession. So it could res uh, uh, arise as uh, variations in eccentricity. Skipping on, it is concluded, this is the next to the last paragraph, it is concluded that changes in the Earth's orbital geometry are, fundamental, are the fundamental cause of the succession of quaternary ice ages. You convinced? Well, it's probably a little more convincing if you know that there has to be that much time and you know that there has to be some cause for those things and to have the chances of this happening uh, right on the Milankovitch cycles, well, at least with the same frequency as the Milankovitch cycles, um, it's kind of hard to refute. One thing that's interesting, as we'll see, is that the Milankovitch cycles don't change how much solar energy we get enough to account for the ice ages. Skipping on, here. Um, here's Lisecki, who uh, uh, comments, and uh, again, I'm just pulling this out as a, as a more or less standard article. It's not, um, or a more or less usual article, maybe that's a better way of putting it. Uh, using a cross-wavelet phase analysis, I show that the relative phases, uh, phase of eccentricity in glacial cycles has been stable since 1.2 million years ago, supporting the hypothesis that 100,000 year glacial cycles are paced by eccentricity. So these go back to 1.2 million years ago. Now do a little math, 100,000 years, 1.2 million years, that means we're talking 12 cycles. So our four ice ages have now bloomed into 12. Um, uh, another sort of representative article, synchronization of the climate system to eccentricity forcing and the 1,000-year problem, which uh, the whole article is available on the Internet uh, easily. Um, over the past million years, glacial interglacial cycles have had a period of about 100,000 years, similar to the 100,000-year period of change in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. You see, they're connected. 
However, the change in incoming solar res radiation insulation at this time scale is small and therefore difficult to reconcile with the amplitude of the glacial cycles. That is to say that the change in how much solar energy we get is not enough to explain the Milankovitch cycles, uh, or to explain, uh, not the Milankovitch cycles themselves, but to explain the ice ages that they're postulating. And so we, are, we have an effect but it's just not big enough to, to cause, uh, we have a cause, but it's not big enough to make the effect. Um, this issue known as the 100K year problem, which means that lots of other people have noticed it as well, is compounded by a lack of explanation for the transition of the length of the cycles from 41,000 to 100,000 at the mid Pleistocene transition 1.2 million years ago Wait a minute. So it started out as 41,000. It's now 100,000. So in addition to those 12 cycles already, now we're talking about 41,000, presumably all the way back to the beginning of the Pleistocene, which is, by standard definition, is about uh, 2.6 million years ago. So now we've got dozens, literally dozens, of ice ages with no evidence, well, but that it was all destroyed. Um, this is turning out to be quite uh, complicated. All done on, presumably, on oxygen-18 uh, variations on, uh, on the seafloor deposits. Individual discrepancies have been explained, for example, through interactions between other orbital frequencies such as obliquity and the 413,000 year period of eccentricity. I thought it was a 100,000 year period. Now it's 413. Uh, but a unified explanation is lacking. So there's a problem here. Um, just to make things a little more fun, um, there's an article recently that said that most of Greenland ice melted to bedrock in the recent geological past as a study. And of course, you want to know what the recent geological past is, and we're going to talk about that. Findings suggest that the ice sheet is more vulnerable than thought, and Greenland could melt completely to nothing within our, uh, our lifetimes. Interestingly enough, you'll remember the name the Vikings gave to Greenland. It is Greenland, which implies that it didn't have quite as much ice as it does now. Um, and in fact, that the climate was probably less than what they called Iceland, um, or less severe. Findings suggest the ice sheet is more vulnerable than thought, and this is a relatively recent article, um, based on a recent article as well, which we'll look a little bit about, uh, a, little, a little bit at. Scientists have found evidence in a chunk of bedrock drilled from nearly two miles below the summit of Greenland ice sheet that the sheet nearly disappeared for an extended time in the last million years or so, because now you know what the... Um, what the time frame they're talking about is. The finding casts doubt on assumptions that Greenland has been relatively stable during the ge recent geological past, and it implies that global warming could tip it into decline more precipitously than previously thought. Such a decline could cause rapid sea level rise. The findings appear this week in the leading journal, Nature. So th this must be really important stuff. It got into the best journal around. The study is based on perhaps the Earth's rarest geological sample, the only bit of bedrock yet retrieved from the ice sheet's base more than two decades ago. The authors say that chemical isotopes in it indicate that the surface was exposed to open sky for at least 280,000 years over the last 1.4 million years. That is to say, over a quarter of the time. The reason would have been natural, probably tied to cyclic natural climate change that has caused ice ages to wax 
and wane. The scientists say that in the most conservative interpretation, that is to say the one that allows for the most ice recently, there might have been only one ice-free period that ended 1.1 million years ago, but was 250,000 years long or more. But more likely, they say, the ice vanished multiple times for shorter periods closer to the present. Skipping on within the, this is how they did it, within the rock, the scientists found traces of radioactive beryllium-10 and aluminum-26, isotopes produced by tiny particles from outer space that constantly bombard the planet's surface. The isotopes decay at known rates, and since they cannot be created if the rock is covered with ice, their abundance can be tied to how long ago the rocks were exposed. Modelers agree that the region where the, the core came from would be one of the last to melt were the ice sheet to disappear. I'll show you a picture of that in the article itself in a minute. The authors thus conclude that the ice sheet must have been down to less than 10% of its current size when the site was ice free. So we're talking about near complete melting of uh, Greenland. Skipping on the story source, and of course they give the journal reference, and you can go to the journal reference. Uh, that is, if you go to uh, uh, the uh, buffalo.edu uh, site, and Greenland was nearly ice-free for extended periods during the Pleistocene. And here is a model of how ice should melt from Greenland if it melts. And you'll see that the drill core um, is easily covered with ice at 50%, is somewhat covered with ice at 10%, and really it takes about 5% before the uh, drill site gets exposed at least according to current models. The geochemistry of Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2, that's GISP 2 for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, silty basal ice has been interpreted as being constant, consistent with the scenario of continuous ice cover for the past 2.6 million years. So they used to say it was covered for the entire time. And Trapped air enclosed in the silty ice layer of the nearby Greenland Ice Seat Project core indicate basal ice ages exceeding one million years. So it used to be thought this was covered for the entire last four traditional ice ages or uh, 12 modern ice ages, um, or maybe 10. Uh, Beryllium-10 concentrations from 9,800 plus or minus 4, uh, 490 atoms per gram to 24,800. Um, these are measured by, uh, uh, very carefully by uh, uh, accelerator mass spectrometers. Uh, same thing that is being used now to do carbon-14 dating. Um, and 26 aluminum, that should be a, Upper 26, I missed putting that, uh, superscripting that. Um, concentrations are 54,000 to 88,000, uh, fairly accurate me measurements. Um, and uh, these are one to two orders of magnitude above the blank levels, that is to say, they can measure it that closely. And three to four orders of magnitude above the concentration expected from cosmogenic nuclide production by deeply penetrating cosmic muons at the base of a three kilometer thick ice sheet. The ice sheet forms an effective shield over this area, and you shouldn't get those isotopes if the ice had been on there. Now, for, for what it's worth, I don't think I, it says here, but the half life of Beryllium-10 is 1.2 million years, and the half-life of aluminum-26 is about 700,000 years. Um, the measured in situ ratio of aluminum-26 to beryllium-10 are 4.2 in the top sample and 4.1 in the lower sample, so basically pretty close. 
significantly below the surface production ratio of 6.75. So somehow some of the aluminum has decayed away um, or wasn't produced at that point. This indicates that the period of surface exposure recorded by the, those concentrations was followed by a considerable t period of time in which the samples were deeply enough buried, presumably by the Greenland ice sheet, to stop the cosmic ray flux and let the 26 to 10 uh, aluminum to 10 ber uh, beryllium ratio decay during burial with an apparent half-life of 1.4 million years, uh, that is, for the ratio to decay. These 26 aluminum to 10 beryllium ratios limit the duration of continuous ice cover um, to a maximum duration of 1.1 plus or minus 0.1 million years. And uh, to summarize the direct and robust evidence, I'm just picking out a few of these paragraphs from the GIFT to Bedrock Core shows that the GIS Greenland ice sheet was almost completely absent for an extended period of time during the Pleistocene. Our results do not directly determine the ice dynamical processes responsible. They don't say how this happened, but they do give you limits. The first order result is incompatible with many existing ice sheet models. For example, one that covers it for 2.6 million years, that just won't work. Uh, or their respective climate driving scenarios and provides important constraints for future simulations of past and future changes of the Greenland ice sheet. Models driven by boundary conditions appropriate to the warmest and most pronounced Pleistocene interglaciations must simulate the near total disappearance of the ice sheet. So Greenland, had, in, during the Pleistocene sometime, was out. And here's some models that are compatible. That is, you can go back 1.1 million years, and then all of a sudden it was free for 250,000, or maybe there's a few times that it was exposed, and then way back here it was exposed for a prolonged period of time. If you assume that every time the, the, there's an interglacial, the ice sheet melts completely, then you're looking at uh, something that could go back, uh, but, it, but it's, uh, it means that if there's a quarter of the time it's, it's open. So those are... Uh, and by the way, while we're at it, look at the ice sheet, uh, ice ages. There's one, this is five, seven, nine, eleven, thirty-one, forty-seven. I divide those by two because each up counts for one, and each down counts for one. Um, so this is really more like um, sixteen ice ages or so, and this is. Uh, but you can see that we're talking about hundreds of ice ages if you follow the conventional chronology. And you can see that, according to them, this switches from that 100,000 dominant to 41,000 dominant um, up and down. Now, that's a proxy temperature presumably done by uh, either oxygen 18 or by the frequency of certain radiolarians. However, we know it hasn't been open for 400,000 years. How do we know that? Uh, fossil DNA prov proves Greenland once had lush forests. Ice sheet is surprisingly stable. So it doesn't melt every 100,000 years. And, and this actually preceded the former one at the Dye 3 drilling site. They, they mentioned they were trying to get DNA from, from uh, organisms at some of the other drilling sites that are thicker, and it didn't work. So they were probably destroyed by heat from the Earth's surface, uh, pardon me, from the inside the Earth or something. Um, um, maybe just geological scouring? Um, at the Dye 3 drilling site, the ice is only two kilometers thick, and here the DNA material was so well preserved that Eski Willerslev could extract genetic traces of a long list of plants and insects and thereby reconstruct ancient plant and animal life. Whoa! That is interesting, and certain climate theories were overturned. The res research results are the first direct proof that there was forest in southern Greenland. 
Furthermore, Willerslev found genetic tra traces of insects such as butterflies, moths, flies, and beetles. But when was that? According to most scientific theories to date, all of southern Greenland and most of the northern part were ice-free during the last interglacial period 125,000 years ago. That is the first, well, counting from us, just before the first ice age. Uh, when the climate was five degrees warmer than the interglacial period we currently live in. Hmm. So uh, now we're, we're hearing claims that uh, during the interglacials it got actually warmer. Okay. So, yes? Must have been a lot of uh, activity, uh, cars and so on burning. Um, well, that's probably that true, yeah. The, the uh, Neanderthals had a, had a really good automobile industry going. Um, this theory, however, was not confirmed by Willerslev and co-workers' subsequent datings. He analyzed the insect's mitochondria, which are special genomes that change with time and, like a clock, can be used to date the DNA. He also analyzed their amino acids, which also change over time. Um, both datings showed that the insects were at least 450,000 years old. Now, that raises some interesting questions. If mitochondrial Eve suddenly got shifted using modern changes from 200 to 250,000 or so, uh, years back to now only about 6,500 years. Are these mitochondria also inflated? How are they, how are they dated? You'd really like to have some uh, data on that. Um, the ice core researchers are experts at analyzing the fine dust which blows onto the ice and is preserved year by year. They adv advocate two further datings. One is dated by dating by optically stimulated luminescence. It is a method when, where the examined minerals can be af affected to give off a type of light, which depends on how long it has been since the minerals were last exposed to sunlight. Um, the other method is radioactive dating. We can f fix when the ice was last in contact with the atmosphere. Um, Jorgen Peter Stephenson explains that the special isotopes, beryllium-10, chlorine-36, both have a particular half-life of radioactive decay, just like carbon-14. And in case if you may remember, beryllium-10 is 1.2 million years. Chlorine-36 is about 300,000 years for what it's worth. The relation between them can date when the ice and dust were buried to get and no longer came in contact with the atmosphere. Okay, so... The dating of dust particles also shows that it has been at least 450,000 years ago since the area of Die 3 drilling in the southern part of Greenland was ice-free. So, hmm. let's go back just a bit here. Let's see, first of all, yeah, Die 3 is drilling in this area here. So if there's been ice co cover there, that should have happened, uh, that should have melted before the ice core in the middle melted. So now we have a problem trying to figure out which one of those you're going to believe. In addition to that, what that's saying is that this model here um, won't work because you have to go at least 400,000, so five has to drop out, and you have to have something like nine. That is, if they've done their work correctly. And so let's uh, come back here. Um, the dating of dust particles also showed that it has been at least 450,000 years since the area of the Die 3 drilling in the southern part of Greenland was ice-free. So we have four different dating methods that say it's 450,000 years. And they all say the same thing, so it must be the case. 
Now, I, my comment on all this, uh, the geology seems to be a profession where small amounts of data can support a large theoretical superstructure. Um, superstructures can be in conflict with each other without resolution of the problems and without anyone feeling undue strain. It would probably be wise for all of us to be more circumspect in our conclusions. Uh, but that's my opinion now. It's your turn. I would I would come in defense of geology uh, partially. Some aspects of geology are definitely that way. Too many of them. Uh, geologists uh, get into certain ideas and uh, they seem to follow them for a few years as, as a dominant paradigm and then they move to to another ID uh, and so on and so forth and it happens to be which ID is in vogue as to where you get the research money for. Uh, but uh, there are some aspects of geology that are, you know, uh, mineralogy for instance is, is uh, more almost close to an experimental science. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. that. I, I think uh, that uh, mm. I think that when you're trying to describe how you know how much mm. shear stress a block of granite will take, that's something you can measure in the laboratory, uh, and it's likely to you know give you a range for different <laughs> blocks of granite. But it, uh, a the measurements for an individual block are reproducible, uh, and b um, uh, the range can be statistically uh, evaluated. When you start talking about time, and all you have is oxygen 18 and uh, <laughs> the uh, relative abundance of certain radiolarians, um, I tend to be a little more cautious about extrapolating that data. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think what we have here is a case. If you believe a certain model, you get some data that fits into it, yeah, and uh, it can confirm your 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 faith. Uh, and uh, this uh, Milankovitch cycle and so on, it, it, some of the data it's based on is is very weak. Uh, but uh, if you don't want to believe in it. Uh, you have to uh, say, well, this is, you're really out here in kind of a speculative area. And uh, it's not just this area. I, I might mention the stromatolite, microbiolite uh, story that's going on and the uh, uh, acknowledge, we might state at present, some of the... Uh, you have all kinds of people making all kinds of species out there out of structures that they have no idea whether they are were alive or not, uh, and so on. And uh, it, it tends to remove science from uh, the respect that it used to have. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, if if science wants to regain. Uh, some of the respect that it had in the past, uh, uh, these these areas need to shore up a little bit their objectivity. Yeah, and the other thing is I think we need to be a little bit cautious about, ah, now we've got this piece of data. It proves this. You know, one of the things I'm thinking of is here, here's all this ice, and it's supposed to be moving eventually. And that means that there should be some of the surface that was there is ground off. And yet nobody seems to take that into account when they are, you know, they drill down and they get a certain uh, aluminum to 26. Who says that was a surface back then? Who says that wasn't, you know, uh, 20 or 30 feet down and the rest of it's been ground off? Um, 
I think you just you have to be really, really cautious about uh, about making blanket assumptions in that kind of a situation. It's a two-edged sword when we realize that uh, we tend to believe what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, the only cure for that is go back to the hard data. Yeah. Uh, whether that be fulfilled prophecies in the Bible, or whether that be the original life, or other factors, but uh, the hard data does not uh, leave you without some rather uh, striking conclusions. Yeah. Well, what you have to be careful of is that uh, uh, that here's this theory about time, and it's you know it's based on things that don't specifically have any direct relationship with time. Um, and I think we just we have to be really cautious about how we how we assume that this theory is true, and then so we build another theory on it, and we build another theory on it, and we build another theory on it. And pretty soon you get some really fantastic sandcastles. Uh, uh, this is the, the paradigm problem. Uh, it, the, these, these stories build up for a while, and then they're dropped, and then another story builds up, and then another story builds up. You go th through uh, geological interpretations, you can find that over and over again. Uh, and one needs to be critical of this, especially the data before the paradigm is completely accepted. After the Derby Brian is completely accepted, the literature no longer questions basic assumptions. A simple question. When my grandkids say, was the Ice Age? When did it happen? What do I say? Well, okay. Uh, I'm going to say some things, but I'm going to preface it with, and I don't really know, and I'm not sure anybody else really knows. Uh, there was probably one Ice Age, if you're... Uh, uh, fitting it into a flood theory. And it probably happened either at or shortly after the flood. There are reasons for arguing it happened shortly after, but I'm going to leave those alone for now. Um, and it probably happened because of the flood, because one of the things that has to happen, and you'll read this a number of places, is that you have to have warm enough oceans to evaporate enough water to uh, produce all the snow that, that winds up uh, blanketing much of the northern hemisphere. Probably you have to have the Arctic Ocean free of ice. And immediately after the flood would be a great time to have that, where you have water mixed from all over the world and warmer water, and it sounds a little bit paradoxical to have to need warm water in order to get an ice age. But the idea is that you have to get enough snow. It's not just a matter of getting it cold. It's a matter of, of getting enough precipitation. Um, and so it would probably have happened shortly after the flood um, and lasted for probably a few thousand years, or, maybe, or pardon me, a few hundred years. And um, how much, I wouldn't know. Uh, the, there are mammoths that are buried in snow, in permafrost. Um, that an ice age happened is pretty much un unquestionable. If you go to Yosemite, you will still see where glaciers have carved it out, and you can see valleys that instead of coming down to a V, like the normal erosion pattern, have this U shape. And in fact, where Bridal Vale Falls comes, you can see where another U shaped valley comes in and gets clipped off by the big one, and it producing what is known as a hanging valley. And so 
I have to explain this to my grandkids, and they say, well, what, what are all these people talking about millions of years, and what, what's going on? Because they have been they have been told originally that it had to take millions of years because everything was slow okay. and so the 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 question is whether you start things very very slowly a um, little bit at a time or whether you have things going along very rapidly with a lot of water um, th and that's that's the basic question. What's the life of DNA? They're testing DNA, and uh, we're getting to 450,000 years. 450,000 years. Is DNA survivable for 450,000 years? Well, it didn't used to be thought of as survi being survivable, but uh, obviously, they're getting uh, they're getting results that they that they feel they can trust. Uh, the thing I find interesting is that if that's the case, then where we have fossils that are in that kind of area, northern Canada, Alaska, Siberia, it raises the question as to whether we could be able to recover some of those from way back when. Because you see, in our theory, you have a flood fairly recently and then an ice age after it, and if you get permafrost, then it stays frozen today. And in fact, one of the things that has been done at Southern Adventist University is to test some of the material they got from permafrost that's supposed to be of Eocene age, that is 40 million years, of which only under standard theory the last 2.6 maximum million years has been frozen. So, you know, 38, whatever, 37 million years has been open to the, uh, open to uh, standard climate. Well, that shouldn't have any DNA whatsoever. Um, and yet my understanding is that uh, they're getting partial sequences out of it. Uh, you know, which, of course, it's just nuts if you're looking at it from a long age perspective. Um, I, I'd like to see if uh, Lee Spencer will be publishing any of that stuff anytime soon. You probably will have to put it in a creationist journal simply because I doubt anybody else would take it. In fact, I think there's some other stuff being done on that particular uh, uh, some lipid uh, analysis and stuff like that, which uh, again, if you say f 37 million years under the stars and then freeze it for three million years, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you freeze it, if it's 4,000 years of which three, of which all but maybe, I don't know, 50, 100 years are frozen, uh, then it makes a lot more sense. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm interested. You 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 say that there's no direct relationship with time and all of this, but the, that's what the strength of the molecular cycles show that it's directly related to time. You, that those cycles are accurately known in years. So to find the, the, the those three periodicities within uh, the sediment cores, the ice cores looking at the oxygen and microfossil uh, amounts, um, uh, those, you can't deny that that time, those time periods are there because we can ca calculate accurately these orbital variations for, uh, back millions of years. And uh, uh, to say that, that uh, there's no direct relationship to time, the time in years is real in that data. And that's um, what the molecular cycles show. That's why they have that much confidence in that, those kind of time periods. The, the 450,000 year time period, that's a, that's a beat frequency of the, uh, of the orbital eccentricity. And uh, so you're going to see that's going to dominate. 
And so, you know, to, to see those kind of things related to the actual eccentricity, which is accurately calculated in time, is, is just denying uh, the, the, the actuality that this is, there's long periods of time present in this data. And it's real. You can't just poo-poo it. Oh. It, it, the fossil uh, data is much better than what he's showing here. There's been more work done on this than, yeah. than what you're showing. Uh, well, there, ha there has been more work. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that you have, um, you have the effect where uh, data tends to coalesce around already established data. No, this... And, and, um, no, it, if you try to publish something that were to be, let's say, completely chaotic to what we have now, you'd probably find it difficult to publish, and when you did, it would have to be in a journal that... Uh, was kind of desperate for content. Uh, if you have something that confirms what people already know, um, it gets in the it gets in the major journals. Did you notice that that there was no known mechanism? The Milankovitch cycles are not enough to force the climate, and it plainly said that and everybody recognizes but, it. But the data still shows the cycles. No, we know the I'm spectral, not saying we, that the, we, that the spectral structure cycles. of those cycles, the spectral structure in terms of time frequency, is actually known, accurately known. We know what the shapes of those are. You showed the plots early in, in the beginning. Yeah. Those plots are accurately known and because we know those accurately, you can stick those into the, uh, to the, the, uh, the measurements that are made and you can pull those things out. And the fact that you can pull them out and the strengths that they do means they're really there. Okay. The, um, the correlation of those cycles with time uh, comes from carbon-14 dating in one case, which I have reasons for suspecting. Yeah, I know it's you. Um, then they come from, uh, I believe one of them is uh, Barbados and the uh, uh, uranium uh, disequilibrium dating, which there are reasons for suspecting as well. Um, and finally, uh, uh, finally, magnetic reversal dating. And there are reasons for suspecting that. They don't, uh, magnetic reversal dating does not say anything about time. All it says uh, is about magnetic reversals and how fast they happened and when they happened are not defined by time. The only, if you have a continuous, uh, if you have a continuous series that goes uh, f from one, uh, from one time to another, and you can you can say that there have been or have not been magnetic reversals that have been detected in that period of time. Then you have a reversal, but there are several reversals in the field, and they have occasionally been misidentified even by uh, even by the standard geological. Uh, and they're not directly related to. You can't look at a magnetic reversal and say, oh, this happened at this time without a lot of more evidence as to uh, where it fits. Yeah, but you've got this foundation and these Milankovitch cycles where we do know accurately the pro, uh, the, you know, what, what, uh, what is, you know, that this, those signatures are there. And, and uh, it's, uh, you, you, you can't, deny that because the, the analysis has been very thorough. The mathematical statistical analysis that has been there in a significant way has, um, uh, you know, it's been done in several methods to pull those components out. And they're real and they're there. 
which indicates directly time. This is the typical history of, para of paradigm. An idea gets accepted a little bit, and then the only way you can do good science is if you fit it in that paradigm. Uh, take the case of global um, uh, plate tectonics and so on, you know. Man, uh, when, the, when the idea was suggested by Wagner that the continents might move, he was ridiculed, he was made fun of, he was, uh, and all kinds of data was proposed that it showed it was wrong, until uh, finally some data forced them in the other way, and boy, now if you don't believe it, you're really crazy. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the sociology of science needs to be studied very carefully. Science has gone down all kinds of ideas that have demonstrated that they're wrong and that it's been revised and it's, uh, it's, it's good that science revises itself and so on, but in the meantime, you must keep in mind that, hey, uh, how many ideas are out there that we're not critically looking at? Well, I think there's more than that, and that is uh, go back in time to um, probably about 40 years ago again. And I'll get it to him. Oh, he's leaving. We want to. We want to get your comment. We just I wanted him to to talk for a little bit. But. You get it on the fly. May I stand up <laughs> with a cane? Okay. <laughs> but it occurs to me that while we're preoccupied, and that is to say, frozen with the ice age question that simultaneously uh, another process was going on of even more relevance certainly at the gas stations today is that uh, whole huge masses of greenery was being transformed into oil under the earth. And the, it, having pointed that out in a kind of poetic symmetry, I certainly can't go any further, but uh, it just uh, spikes my curiosity and uh, sense of symmetry that uh, here we are dealing with glaciers and ice ages in which the parameters are stratified and extremely delicate and nuanced having to do with isotopes of oxygen and so forth whereas simultaneously or at least congruently as we believe it in terms of uh, the uh, of the noaic and uh, disaster uh, a great organic transformation uh, from discrete organic material, and that is to say plants and trees and even, we presume, human life and much uh, animal life was being transformed into just plain crude oil. Uh, is it possible, other than to be poetic, is it possible to have any kind of scientific correlation between these two processes? Well, there probably is. Um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that there was a time when the authorities, including the National Park Service, uh, talked about uh, a fossil forest in Yellowstone that lasted for, what, 300,000 years or something like that? And they thought they had it correlated. And then as time went on, we found out that there were other things that had not been looked at that argued that this uh, deposit was actually laid down in a matter of probably months or less. Um, and uh, basically that took a lot of work, but it got to the point where 
it's pretty well recognized uh, that the fossil forests aren't uh, deposits of hundreds of thousands of years. And the uh, National Park Service finally took their sign down, by the way. Um, and I think that it's, I think that sometimes we're in that same position where the correlations look pretty good, but nobody has really looked at them carefully with a, uh, a little more jaundiced eye than, than, what, uh, than what is usually done. And one of the things I'm pointing out is that we have some absolutely contradictory claims about how long G Greenland has been under ice. And, you know, they both can't be right. And so at least one is wrong, maybe both. Uh, even though they're using data that looks at first pass like it ought to pass muster. And so I think that we need to be a little bit careful about just assuming that all those cycles have been uh, confirmed and we've got everything right. So. I think that that I think that that's one of the things. The other thing is, you know, I've seen this I've seen this movie before. Um, there was a time when there was an absolute insistence that floods didn't happen, and then uh, J. Harlan Britz convinced the world that yes, indeed, there had been one major flood uh, in the last. Uh, 15,000 years, I think, is where it's normally da dated now, um, that, uh, that had, you know, covered a good share of the state of Washington and, and some of Oregon and, and, uh, and Idaho. And then there was, again, a paradigm shift. And now, instead of one flood that did it, there are hundreds of floods, almost because that's the way geologists think. The, 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 the actual evidence for the hundreds of floods is kind of thin. You know, it's one geological site that looks like it has layers on it. Turns out you can get those layers on a single flood and it's been I wouldn't say experimental, but certainly observationally demonstrated. Um, and, and so what I'm arguing is not that they have to be wrong. I'm arguing that we need to exercise caution um, before assuming that the superstructure is sound because when you are extrapolating from this and that and then you start doing some correlation, you can make some stuff that looks pretty, pretty impressive. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will, it will be um, an accurate uh, portrayal of reality. Have they done um, any research into how geothermal activity might affect some of these processes? Um, well, geothermal en energy is is used as one of the arguments that why one of the other cores didn't have any uh, DNA that they could detect on it. So they're thinking about germ geothermal energy. They're also thinking about how fast geothermal energy is going to melt uh, Greenland's ice cap. Um, and so, yeah, they're taking it somewhat into account. It's hard to say exactly how much they should take it into account. Um, I, think, I think we have a right to be a little bit skeptical. Uh, where people have hard data, I think we can recognize that. But where people have data that's correlated with other data that's correlated with other data that uh, is correlated with uh, their use of time, I think that we have a right to, to look at it with just a little bit of caution. I wonder if anybody has looked at the rate 
of glacier migration because if a glacier moves at a certain rate horizontally, or I should say down the slope, it seems to me unreasonable to expect that the original layer that was at the base would stay in place. Well, the, the, the standard answer to that, the, the standard answer to that is what really happens is that at the center where it's spreading out from, that the bottom layers get thinner and thinner and thinner as time goes on and eventually, uh, it, well, let's put it this way. If, if you were to look at the uh, Greenland ice cap right now, if you drill down halfway to the bottom, it only takes about 2,000 years. And depending on, and here's another one of these places where I really have trouble, um, depending on uh, how much you, you count it, some of the center ones uh, will go back either 60,000 or 120,000. And you can, you lose the visual layers at about 2,000 years maybe a little past that. After that, the ice all looks the same. Uh, the only way you can tell that there's anything that's been going on is by uh, measuring the uh, amount of light you can shine through it or the electrical conductivity. Uh, and those things go up and down and you wind up having to decide how much up is a year and how much down is a year. And basically you're looking at the same kind of cyclic variations with uh, overtones and whatever else. And so, uh, you know, and is that a year? Is that really just a snowstorm? <coughs> um, after 2,000 years, the, it becomes much less convincing, let's put it that way. In fact, if you're in, in Antarctica, you don't have yearly levels at all um, because what happens is the, uh, the ice gets blown free. And so you, you, in Greenland, you can actually count them and come pretty close to recorded eruptions. Uh, in Antarctica, basically, it's all extrapolated. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and you just... I've seen so many of these, you know, they go up and down and they up and down and you're not really sure where you're at. And if I'm given three, three dates by methods which I have reason to suspect, I'm not confident that they've got the time frame nailed down at all. Well, you, you can't, uh, I mean, we use celestial objects as our time clocks. Yes. Newtonian mechanics accurately depicts the positions and orientations of orbits with time accurately. We know that, that if we can see these signatures of these periodicities that match the orbital properties and the insulation uh, variations, uh, that we are talking about real time. You're mixing in a lot of hand-waving other things that aren't tied to time, like, like uh, celestial mechanics is. We, well, were able to, we were able to accurately you're, send you're, new horizons. You're not understanding the point, though. No, but you're not understanding my point. What you're doing is what John Lennox would call as being an obscuritant because of throwing all these various things in and have a lot of hand-waving to them and giving them the same weight as what you would do, uh, as you would, uh, uh, you know, in terms of celestial, of what's, what we know about uh, the, our celestial mechanics uh, mm. and how that's tied to time, uh, mm. you, you, you know, it, 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 you know, it just muddies the picture. And you wow. have this fundamental time frame that shows long periods of time that you can't deny. Have, have you done a simplex analysis to 
statistical analysis to be able to pull out how, you know, if you get strong correlation or, or strong um, uh, peaks in the frequency domain that you see in these plots, you know, how do you know how strong they are? Well, when they're peaked like they, they, they show them there, they're very strong and they're real. Um, so, and, and they've done, they've improved, the, they've gone from simplex analysis, which is a linear uh, uh, convolution, mm -hmm. uh, sup uh, superposition of, of, of frequency profiles to a more uh, rigorous <coughs> orthogonality process of uh, uh, ver uh, Verimax uh, rotate using Verimax rotation techniques that allow them to look at these uh, correlations and, rem uh, and remove them the correlations to be able to see the various components. And they see these three orbital components very accurately in the sedimentary data. And mm -hmm. uh, they're there, they're real, and you can't ignore, you can't uh, say that they're, they're, they're equivalent in their weight in determining what time frames there are because uh, with, with <laughs> you know, some estimate of of uh, ice uh, buildup and, and, and removal, that uh, that is a lot less uncertain. You've got this foundation that indicates clearly long periods of time, mm -hmm. and you cannot just ignore that and just throw it out. It's real. That is that is hard data. Ariel talked about the importance of hard data. That is hard data, and you just can't ignore it. The question is not the hard data. The hard data mm -hmm. is what the percentage of oxygen-18 is or percentage of particular radiolarins. No, that you, the, you that have the signatures. <laughs> it, sh it reveals a signature of variation with time. And you can look in that and see if there are signatures of, uh, that match the orbital parameters mm -hmm. of the Earth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those signatures are, are, are embedded in that, in their, in, and that's what they're seeing. Well, what you have to do is you have to establish that it actually is with time. And I think we have to be careful. Or celestial Look, mechanics not, is established in time. Okay. It's... Ariel. No, I, I, we're in a speculative area. Uh, one person's hard data is another person's uh, idea that it's wrong. Uh, I mean, it, it, well, you, we, we've seen, like I say, we've uh, seen this movie before uh, in, in other areas. Uh, and I, uh, <coughs> when I find that there are three things that tie it to time, and I have questions about all three, in fact, I have, uh, I've actually gotten uh, radiocarbon <coughs> to, uh, um, to publish some data. Eventually, I'm going to try to uh, bring that in so that you guys can see uh, what we're talking about. But uh, uh, I know. the assumption that things have always gone on the way they are, they have now, and that um, and that there has not been a major disturbance of the seafloor in the last two million years, is just that. It's an assumption. And you can find the variations. Tying them to time is a little more difficult unless you have a, unless you have a good method. And the question, the, the places where I'm having trouble are the, are the methods. And I know that, I mean, just for example, when they were discussing the uh, um, uh, the molecular clock on mitochondria. Uh, there are two molecular clocks, and they're disparate. One of them is we descended from chimpanzees or, or a chimpanzee-like organism uh, about six million years ago, and so that half of the difference between us and the chimpanzees um, um, uh, should be accounted for, so that's the rate of mitochondrial change. When you do that, you get in a mitochondrial leave about 200,000 uh, years. Uh, the other one is we have seen this much change in people whom we know. 
that is to say the observed historical rate. And when you do that, the time frame suddenly shifted from 200,000 to 6,000, 6,500, something like that. And uh, of course, molecular clocks are notorious for being, you know, they're not exact. Um, but the truth of the matter is that, uh, that whenever you're dealing with a process where, well, like for example, if you're doing um, uranium uh, thorium dating, which is uh, how, uh, how the uh, Barbados coil, uh, coral was done, um, it's dependent on the amount of uranium in the water and it's dependent on the amount of thorium in the water. Both of those can be expected to be disturbed by a worldwide flood. Just, you would expect it, not just uh, could be. Um, one can have discussions on that. When you do that, a point that they're depending on suddenly does not have quite the authority that they would assume for it. See, uniformitarianism is something that goes into a lot of these dating procedures. And not only, I mean, uh, you would expect, for example, more thorium in the water right after a flood because of, uh, you know, the flood uh, having detritus in it. You just expect that. And that's going to throw off your thorium dating. Uh, okay, we'll give her next. Uh, and and so you, you have to be you have to be prepared to at least ask the question of whether they've got the time nailed down. And correlations between cores, yeah, maybe. Um, that they were done in a certain way that that uh, that cycles with Milankovitch cycles. Um, if the if the time anchors really belong shorter, then the correlation disappears. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question. I'm not a scientist, and what he said went over my head. But um, as a simple person, or you know, the average person, and I've read a lot on science, I haven't studied it. So um, if God is supposed to be outside of time, uh, what is time? Are we ever going to talk about space and time here, or physics or something? But uh, if he's outside of time, how do we know if uh, all the things were always the same according to time. I mean, why are there fossils up in the in the Arctic with uh, palms and and plants and all these things? Wouldn't that say something about the tilt of the Earth? Or I don't know. What is time? Are we going to talk about time? Well, we've talked about it some already, but uh, um, that's a subject that would probably keep us here for hours. <laughs> Without a without a complete it just resolution, seems, it seems impossible for me to make any kind of. A, I try to keep an open mind to make any kind of conclusion without knowing more about time. Yeah, oh, that's that's a problem, and uh, and uh, there there's there's two things. One of them is time itself, and the other one is uniformity of processes. Um, are they always have they always been pretty much as they are now? Have there been major catastrophes, and in particular one that covered the entire Earth? And if so, what would that process do to conventional measures of time? And it's a it's a problem that has not been completely thought through. I I think that assuming that uh, we get the answer someday that um, all of us are going to be surprised. Perhaps some more than others, but uh, I don't think anybody's got it right, exactly right Because now. to God, uh, time, as we know, it doesn't exist. I mean, maybe he's, it's almost like everything's simultaneous or something. Well, yeah, but I think that there will come a time 
uh, when uh, the, the, the story of Earth will be wrapped up. And when that happens, hopefully we'll have more answers as to exactly how things fit together. Well, uh, next week you'll get to see how somebody else uh, views uh, Adventism. So come back and enjoy Bernard Brandstater and uh, his view of, of uh, creation. And uh, we'll see you next week.